There has been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, and frankly a lot of outrage over the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones. This episode, which I have affectionately relabeled The Balls because obviously the show found them again, has moved a lot of people. I've had several discussions with friends, I've listened to about a dozen different people on podcasts, I've watched countless YouTube videos, and frankly, I even went on Twitter. That was a bad idea. But I've listened to people and how they feel about what went down this past Sunday. And look, I'm not trying to be ever the contrarian, but I think right now the internet needs a contrarian because, damn. He has the better claim to the throne. Every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. The Mad King gave his enemies the justice he thought they deserved. Children are not their fathers. Be a dragon. You have a gentle heart. Targaryen, alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. You don't want to wake the dragon up, do you? Heart. Hello everybody, I'm Robbie from the Nerdy Nomicon. Giant thumbs up and a giant wink to all of you guys out there that are already subscribers and to those of you who are brand new to the channel and don't know me yet. I am what has been referred to many times as the film, television, and gaming equivalent to eating that last slice of pizza that you know you probably shouldn't while riding a dragon backwards through the hills. I don't have a cutaway for that. This isn't Family Guy. So as I said previously, there has been much discussion and debate as to the nature of Daenerys Targaryen, the mother of dragons, the breaker of chains, the toaster of white bread, the slicer of cheese, titles, 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 titles. And you know what, in some cases I actually get the issue. Since 2013, there have been over 3,500 reported cases of parents naming their children either Khaleesi or Daenerys. So on behalf of them, I get it. Though. To be fair, you did name your daughter Khaleesi, which isn't even a name, it's a title. I mean, that'd be like naming your son Prince. Although, actually, there already is a famous prince, so that logic didn't really translate, did it? Now I'm sad again. Okay guys, before we jump into this episode, the first thing that I desperately need to do for all of you is to give a big, big digital hug and a huge shout out to my amazing patrons at patreon.com slash nerdynomicon. You guys make every single show on this YouTube channel and all of the podcasts and other endeavors that I have my hands in possible. Much love to you guys. Patrons get early access to all podcasts and videos and also have uh, voting for the different topics that I'm going to be presenting for Ramblings of a Madman, of which this is the pilot episode. If this sounds good to you and you guys want to help the channel grow monetarily, head on over to patreon.com slash nerdynomicon and join. All right, one dollar a month less than what you pay a day for a cup of coffee helps this channel in more ways than you can even imagine. Okay, that's enough shameless plug. Let's get on to this. Okay, here's the thing. I'm not in the camp of thinking that this was dumb or bad or reckless or out of nowhere. Extreme? Yeah, yeah, definitely, but not out of nowhere. I mean, we've been building to the Mad Queen for a while now. They've been dropping breadcrumbs since, like, season one. The way she watched her own brother die. But, I mean, yeah, he was a horrible, abusive monster, so... Let's move on. What about outside of Korth? You know, how she threatens the Thirteen with fire and blood, and that, you know, also says that she's gonna raise cities if they don't help her, and she'll destroy them first. Okay, but on the other hand, she was also in an impossible position, because if they didn't help her, then herself and her Kalasar would likely die, so... Okay, okay, let's move along from that. Okay, wait, season one again. Okay, burning Mary Mazdur alive after the spell she cast killed her unborn son and turned Khal Drogo into a vacuous husk. Look, I can't say I would have acted much different. Or, you know, in Astapor, when she frees the Unsullied and then torches the slave masters alive. Or Maureen, Maureen, when she crucifies the, the wise masters. Okay, so, like, all of these examples are of her dispensing justice to villainous wretches... I, I get that, you know, that is completely fair. 
but I'm just trying to point out her tendencies here. The bloodthirsty nature that she has inside of her, for righteousness or not. Like when she roasted Sam's dad and brother for not bending the knee, roasted them alive in their armor. That's sometimes what conquerors have to do when someone stands in defiance, right? Westeros doesn't know her, doesn't love her. She's not a breaker of chains here. She isn't Misa here. She was in Essos, but back here, she is the daughter of the Mad King. The daughter of a psychopath who wanted to destroy the city when he saw the end coming. Burn them all was his famous last words. So when she goes up north and deals with the northerners who don't welcome her with open arms, how is she supposed to feel? I mean, Sansa even flat out asks her what about the north, slapping away that friendly olive branch. Sansa's gone through a couple of things, sure, but to defy Danny like that? But you know, Danny kept it cool. And again, when Jon informed her that he has a better claim to the throne, and you know, when her personal Jiminy Cricket, Sir Jorah Mormont died, and when two out of her three dragons died in front of her, and also when Sansa laid the seeds to openly begin a campaign to usurp her, and when Varys tried to poison her while notifying the other great houses of Jon's birthright, homegirl kept her cool. You know? Okay, guys, look, obviously I'm being ironic with my tone here, but, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is you pour all of the tragedy that she has faced, her dead child, her dead children, leaving Dario and Essos, being rejected by Jon, Jon being her nephew, Jon being the true heir to what she's been fighting for her entire life to get. Add all of that together, simmer in some drops of Targaryen madness in the bloodline, and you got a stew going. But we still need some more ingredients. Spices to top it off. And it wasn't the death of Masande. It wasn't Tyrion's failings. It wasn't even the fact that she knows nobody loves her here. They don't know her. They don't want her. They don't care about her. It was this. I've always hated the bells. They ring for horror. A dead king, a city under siege. A wedding. Exactly. Danny is a powder keg, and all she needs is a match. And this was it. The bells. The title of the episode. The bells that signified the surrender of King's Landing. The chimes of battle. So much like the bells that signify victory in Essos, right? That the Dothraki braid into their hair, that remind her of that first bit of happiness she ever had, the first mistake she ever made, her first great loss, her first act of vengeance, called Drogo. I have seen some theories online trying to link the madness and the setting off to the bells, trying to say that, oh, Khal Drogo, you know, raped her and tortured her. No. It wasn't that. Yes, she was sold into a marriage. Yes, that is traumatic. Yes, she was sold into that marriage and abused, and it was all orchestrated by her brother. But Drogo was her first love, and her attempt to save him and the sacrifices that she made ended up amounting to her first true loss. Call Drogo. Daenerys is not a queen. She is a Khaleesi a conqueror, and the bells light the match. And as I already stated, maybe that's the reason why this episode is called The Bells, not just because of Tyrion's plan. When the bells ring, the city surrenders, but the double meaning, the trigger for her PTSD. And yes, it was PTSD, man. A phenomenal Game of Thrones YouTuber that I highly suggest you all click over and check as soon as you're done with this video, uh, named Robris, said that Jon's rejection of her was the final straw, but I don't really think that that's true. The final straw was something much, much smaller. It wasn't something that was added to her, it was something that she heard. It was the bells. And with that, to quote another fantastic YouTuber, Hacks Dogma, the Mad King had a daughter. A daughter who finished his work. She burned them all because nobody looked at her the way they did John. Not on this side of the sea. 
In Essos, they did, sure. In Essos, she was loved. In Essos, she was Misa. In Essos, she could love in return. In Essos, she once had Drogo, who loved her back. But that's all gone now. Her joy has turned to ashes in her mouth. And finally, it's time for the world to taste them too. Yeah, sure, I'm thrilled that my prediction was right and we got the Mad Queen. I think it's an amazing arc. I think that it is so awesome to have a badass character, regardless of gender, fighting against the tyrants and those who wish to hurt and oppress, but then ultimately end up becoming that exact same thing that they were fighting against. I love that. I love a complex character, but don't misunderstand what happened to her. This is not caused by one inciting incident, and I'm not saying that it's the bells that struck her and that made her turn crazy. Danny is not just, as people have been saying, flicking a switch and going insane. This was slow. This was a buildup. Whether you'd like to recognize it or not, this has been building since the first time she was on screen. This whole arc was not a light switch. It was tick-tock, tick-tock, crazy's coming. This was a culmination of everything. Every hurt, every loss, trauma, setback. This is a woman who was sold to her husband. She had no choice in that. This is a woman who had to learn and fight for everything on her side of the sea. And when she finally comes over to Westeros and tries to help, offers assistance to the people that needed her, that would have died without her, she loses so, so much in that process. She didn't flip a switch. She broke. This is not a woman who succumbed to her madness. It is a woman who fell into it. And the madness was not just that of a Targaryen. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying that what she did was monstrous. And I'm saying that it was atrocious. But I'm also saying that it was right there in front of us the entire time. We just weren't looking. Or in this particular case, we weren't listening. The showrunners crafted this narrative into this series, and we finally got the sum of all of its parts. They surrendered, she won, but it was too late. And all that's left is Dragonfire. Or, you know, maybe I'm just completely wrong, and I watched the episode wrong, and I suck at life. You know, basically anything I've said already are valid possibilities. Don't forget to let me know what you guys think in the comments section down there below. Hit that like button and do not forget to hit that subscribe button too. It helps out the channel a whole bunch. Make sure you keep on coming back for more ramblings of a madman, sinful analysis where I do deep dive film analyses, fun tag at Tuesdays, and coming soon, gaming content. Because I love Dark Souls and Magic the Gathering.